They started recording. Welcome. Is, is there a volume control here? Okay, welcome to our afternoon session of the Reformation Lectures. Uh, this afternoon, our speaker is Dr. Angus Manouj. Angus J. L. Manouj is Chair of the Philosophy Department and Co-Chair of the Classical Education Program at Concordia University, Wisconsin. He was raised in England and became a U.S. citizen in 2005. He holds a B.A. in Philosophy from Warwick University and M.A. and Ph.D. in Philosophy from UW-Madison and the DCA Diploma in Christian Apologetics from the International Academy of, of Apologetics, Evangelism, and Human Rights. Angus has written many peer-reviewed and popular articles on the philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, philosophy of law, apologetics, C.S. Lewis, and the foundation of ethics. He is author of Agents Under Fire, Materialism and the Rationality of Science, and editor of C.S. Lewis, Light Bearer in the Shadowlands, Christ and Culture in Dialogue, a Reading God's World, Legitimizing Human Rights, and Religious Liberty and the Law. He is co-editor with Jonathan J. Luce and J.P. Moreland of the Blackwell Companion to Substance Dualism, and with Barry W. Boozy of the Inher Inherence of Human Dignity, Volume 1 and 2. His forthcoming edited collections focus on the mind and the brain and the rights of conscience. Angus is past president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. And he will be speaking today on Lutheran social ethics. Please welcome Dr. Angus Manouj. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is the third time I've been on your uh, beautiful uh, campus, and I really uh, appreciate uh, this, this event. Um, and there's some interesting tie-ins uh, with uh, Dr. Stegemeyer's. My own recent work has been on that topic, uh, the inherence of human dignity, as was mentioned in a couple of uh, volumes uh, in this area. But today, I'm going to be speaking about Lutheran social ethics. So, foundational to Lutheran social ethics are, of course, the doctrines of the two kingdoms and of vocation. But unfortunately, the key terms of these doctrines may easily mislead and are open to more than one legitimate interpretation. Should we understand the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world in Augustinian terms as comprised of two distinct classes of people, Christians and non-Christians? Or should we focus instead on God's two modes of governance, the eternal, and the temporal, which overlap in the Christian because he is in the world, but not of it, and simultaneously saint and sinner. Likewise, shall we, like many theologians, focus exclusively on vocation as a calling reserved for Christians, or shall we broaden our account to include various offices and orders of creation instituted by God which shape and affect Christians and non-Christians alike. The choice of interpretation here will also affect our understanding of the battle between God and Satan over every human soul. On one reading, this is a battle between redeemed Christians and the unbelieving world. But on another reading, it is a battle waged over every office, inside and outside the church, 
where God calls us to be obedient to obedient service and Satan calls for disobedience and subversion of God's design. Well, certainly, we should be clear about what we mean by our key terms. But what really matters is that our choice of interpretation is faithful to the biblical record, distinctively Lutheran, and a source of illumination for a wide variety of ethical issues and dilemmas. So in the first part of this paper, I'll offer a reading of two kingdoms and vocation that I argue satisfies these requirements. Then I'll develop the implications of this reading for several important topics of Lutheran social ethics, the family, education, government, and the church. The goal in each case will be to distinguish God's intentions for an office from the sinful temptation to abdicate, subvert, or usurp that office. So two modes of providence. In his classic work on Lutheran social ethics, Paul Althaus argued that Luther himself held different understandings of the two kingdoms. Early on, Althaus claims Luther was influenced by Augustine's view of the fundamental opposition between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. In his 1523 treatise, Temporal Authority, to what extent should it be obeyed, Luther says, quote, we must divide the children of Adam and all mankind into two classes, the first belonging to the kingdom of God, the second to the kingdom of the world. Those who belong to the kingdom of God are all the true believers who are in Christ and under Christ. These people need no temporal law and sword because the righteous man of his own accord does all and more than the law demands. All who are not Christian belong to the kingdom of the world and are under the law. For this reason, God has ordained two governments, the spiritual, by which the Holy Spirit produces Christians and righteous people under Christ, and the temporal, which restrains the unchristian and wicked." End quote. Althaus notes that this way of dividing the kingdom suggests a purely negative view of the world as the sphere of rebellion against God governed by Satan. He writes, quote, all true believers in Christ belong to the kingdom of God and all other people belong to the kingdom of this world. In this usage, world means the sinful world under the lordship of Satan. This already implies that those who believe in Christ because they no longer stand under the law, do not need this earthly government law and the sword. All this is necessary only for the sake of other people." End quote. Althaus complains that on this reading, the left-hand kingdom is reduced to the state's negative role in restraining evil amongst worldly people, but it doesn't include any positive blessings and is unnecessary for Christians. Well, it may be disputed whether Althaus' exposition of Luther is entirely correct, as it can be argued that Luther has a relatively narrow focus in this treatise. One might argue that in temporal authority, Luther is really contrasting the inner man of faith, the Christian qua Christian, who is free from the law, and the outer man, the old Adam, who is still governed by temporal authority. His overarching concern is that temporal authority does not overreach and claim to be Lord of the Christian's conscience, something reserved for God alone. If so, Luther could admit that as a whole person, the Christian is both free of the law, quay redeemed saint, the new person in Christ, and bound by the law, quay sinner, the old Adam. Thus Gustav Wingeren, argues that when the early Luther says that Christians need no law, we should read this as, quote, an abbreviated mode of expression, as he's really only talking about the inner man of faith. 
Quote, in reality, a Christian is of course a sinner even while he's righteous, and as sinner he is subject to the law. Luther often emphasizes the simultaneity of these two governments over one and the same person. On the other hand, Altai seems right that the early Luther unduly narrows the purpose of God's left-hand kingdom to the first use of the law, curbing evil, and this ignores the fact that God instituted various offices and orders of creation even before sin entered the world. For example, before the fall, God assigned all human beings the office of stewardship of the world entrusted to our care, which we'll hear about uh, tomorrow. And he instituted marriage as an order of creation, the proper context for bringing new human life into the world. More generally, while God does, is at work deluding office holders that they have final authority over the inner conscience as well. In Luther's day, there were attempts to confiscate copies of the New Testament and to compel acceptance of other books. <clears throat> Luther's response to this government overreach is it shows a misunderstanding of the inevitable limits of temporal authority. Since temporal authorities cannot save, do not put your trust in princes, they have neither the power nor the right to dictate the terms of salvation, which are reserved by God alone. Luther points out that man cannot discern the heart and therefore in coercing the conscience is like, quote, a judge who should blindly decide cases which he neither hears nor sees. Only God knows the heart, so only he is competent to judge it. Moreover, following Augustine, Luther argues that temporal authorities neither can nor should they try to coerce the conscience. No one could be made to believe something which in their heart they think is false. And the attempt to require belief will at best, quote, compel weak consciences to lie, to disavow, and to utter what is not in their hearts. So those of strong conscience will be unjustly punished because they will not disavow their conviction, and those of weak conscience will be degraded as they're pressured to say what they do not believe. <clears throat> in fact, Luther thought that in his day, the church and state had their proper vocations exchanged. The church was using temporal power to enforce worldly changes when its only legitimate power was over the soul through the word of God. And the state was neglecting its temporal duty to serve and protect the people while attempting to govern their conscience. They rule the souls with iron and the bodies with letters so that worldly princes rule in a spiritual way and spiritual princes rule in a worldly way. <clears throat> Luther paints us a clear picture of how Satan was attempting to subvert office in his time. On the one hand, Satan tempted office holders to abdicate their true office so that princes were preoccupied with dancing, hunting, and racing, and not the welfare of their people. And the church is more concerned with punitive taxation for its building projects than with maintaining true doctrine and faithfully preaching the gospel. On the other hand, Satan also tempted people to usurp offices that had not been entrusted to them, so that the princes attempted to prescribe religious reading and practice as if they were lords of conscience, and the church employed armies as if Christ's kingdom were of this world, something that Christ explicitly denied. <clears throat> So while there are many differences between Luther's European Reformation context and our contemporary scene, it's not hard to see that Satan is still at work attempting to subvert offices. There's been a dramatic escalation of cases in which authorities have attempted to coerce the Christian conscience. Government employees who conscientiously objected to some or all versions of the COVID vaccines were routinely told that their choices were accepting vaccination or losing their job. In some areas, Christians are also being required to use other employers' preferred pronouns, even if the former cannot in good conscience agree that those pronouns are an accurate reflection of biological reality. Similar problems arise for those female athletes who do not believe that biological men claiming to be women are in fact women. So we have secular authorities hard at work invading the sphere of conscience which is reserved for God, and these are clear examples of usurpation of office. At the same time, we see many signs of abdication of office. 
The governing authorities are instituted by God for the welfare of the people, but Satan tempts office holders to see their office as an entitlement to gain more power, influence, and wealth for themselves and their friends, and as a means of imposing agendas without the consent of the governed. Notably, we have office holders today who are beholden to globalist interests and who enact policies that serve these interests, even if they undermine the welfare of the citizens within their jurisdiction. Thus, in European countries, feverish attempts to meet net zero goals by drastic reduction of fossil fuels led to skyrocketing, skyrocketing energy prices and brownouts, so that elderly people on fixed incomes have been forced to choose between heating their house and getting enough food. Environmental stewardship is indeed an obligation for all Christians, but leaders cannot rightly neglect the needs of their neighbors, the citizens entrusted to their care. Turning to Christians in office, Luther is especially concerned that Christian office holders are not deceived into thinking that their office is a license to follow their own desires. Quote, they actually think they can do and order their subjects to do whatever they please. In part three of temporal authority, Luther reminds the Christian prince that as a Christian, he must give consideration and attention to his subjects and really devote himself to it. As Christ, our spiritual ruler, came to serve us, so Christian princes are called to serve and protect their subjects, listen to their problems and defend them, and govern them to the sole end that they, not the prince, may benefit and profit. Luther's very clear that he's not here giving directions to how anyone, Christian or not, should conduct his office, but how anyone occupying the office is to act if he is a Christian. This is very important as through history, Christians have been tempted to think that while they as Christians should do or refrain from doing some action, still they must do otherwise if their office requires them to do so. The idea gains plausibility, for example, from the fact that a Christian judge should forgive a criminal as a Christian, but must demand punishment as a judge. Yet for Luther, this is no contradiction Qua Christian, the judge can and should forgive the criminal. But qua representative of God's temporal rule, he must also carry out his office. However, this distinction between the obligations of the inner and outer man should not be confused with the idea that holding an office exempts the Christian from God's commands in his capacity as an office holder. Thus, notoriously, members of the Deutsche Christen, the German Christians, understood Romans 13 to require unconditional allegiance to the Nazi government in all areas of secular life, so that one could worship God on Sunday but set aside his law by complicity in state-sponsored genocide during the west rest of the week. Luther's thought that there is no such escape hatch for the Christian conscience was well expressed by the famous Barman Declaration, Article 815. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through him. Thus, just as no office holder is authorized to abdicate his office or to usurp another's, so Christian office holders may not walk away from their Christian responsibilities. They're called to be Christians takes precedence over their call to any other office, for otherwise they are violating the first commandment and placing another Lord higher than Christ. Luther also warns of the temptation to abuse delegation. Leaders need helpers to accomplish their tasks, and so they must delegate some work to others. But Luther rightly insists that one may not delegate responsibility. For though we should love our helpers and to some extent trust them, we should not trust them as if they were God. We must take responsibility for actions even when we're aided by others, and we must keep our final trust where it belongs, in God. Delegation of work is therefore um, not abdication, either of personal responsibility uh, or of our need to trust God. These same conflicts between God's purposes, vocation, and office, and Satan's attempted subversion of them play out in a variety of arenas in Luther's time and today, the family, 
education, government, and the church. In every case, Lutheran social ethics must be grounded in God's design for his institutions and offices, and it should explain how to discern and counter attempts to thwart that design. <clears throat> the family. In the large catechism, Luther develops his whole account of God-ordained authority by extension from our obligation to honor and our father and mother as God's representatives. God does not only ask us to love our parents, but also to honor them. Quote, thus he distinguishes father and mother from all other persons on earth, chooses them, and sets them next to himself. For to honor is a much higher thing than to love, for honor includes not only love, but also respect, humility, and awe, directed, one might say, toward a hidden ma majesty of theirs. Young people must therefore have it impressed upon them that they should look up to their parents as representatives of God and bear in mind that however humble, poor, infirm, or eccentric they may be, our father and mother are nevertheless God's gifts to us, end quote. Luther sees the family as the God-ordained place where one learns proper respect for authority in both the left and right-hand kingdoms. From the authority of parents, all other kinds of authority flow at various angles, he says. Thus, schoolmasters teach in loco parentis, in the place of parents. And on account of their office, we should view our leaders in temporal government and in the church as fathers also. In no case is this license for tyranny, quote, for God does not want scoundrels or tyrants to have this office and authority, close quote. Instead, their office implies duties, and these duties are fulfilled not only by providing for the material support of their children, servants, subjects, etc., but especially by training them to the praise and honor of God. Thus, a key principle is that office holders only rightly see their office as under God's authority and existing for his loving purposes. One may think of the family as a miniature society in which children and their parents both learn what respect is due to temporal authority. And if it is a Christian family, it is also a miniature church in which children and their parents both learn what respect is due to the spiritual fathers of the church. Since marriage and the family are instituted by God to uphold order in both temporal and eternal matters, to build civil society and the body of Christ, any attempt to, to subvert that order must be resisted. Whatever Obergefell versus Hodges may say, marriage is not defined by human beings as an affirmation in any, of any and every inclination and relationship they may prefer. Marriage is a God-ordained building block for both society and the church, and he's called one man and one woman to be joined together in one flesh marriage. If we lose this normative structure, marriage is disconnected from its purpose of building a stable foundation for raising society's citizens and the church's members, and it becomes a domain of endless experimentation premised on the idea that self-realization is more important than the good of others. Luther argues that those who fail to respect their earthly parents and the God-ordained structures of marriage and the family will tend also to disrespect temporal and spiritual authority. If we can have marriage and family on our own terms, why not civil society and the church as well? The concern is that the state is reduced to a dispenser of entitlements for people to follow their selfish desires, and the church must offer a wide range of individualized therapies in place of the one gospel with which it has been entrusted. <clears throat> Marriage has also become a battleground in which Satan tempts authorities to violate the Christian conscience. If the state requires officials to solemnize same-sex marriages, what happens if they conscientiously object? Does the state have the authority to compel bakers, florists, and other suppliers of wedding services to offer their goods on the terms specified by same-sex couples? seeking marriage, um, the topic of numerous uh, recent legal decisions. What will happen if plural or other non-standard forms of marriage are recognized? In all of these cases, Christians in office have important obligations. 
They should not violate their conscience, though they may pay a heavy price for uh, refusing to do so. But their protest is also important as an encouragement to other Christians and as a witness to non-Christians. Many non-Christians also support traditional marriage and are dismayed by its redefinition. So when they see that their own secular worldviews, rooted in autonomy and self-realization, are the source of the problem, but also see that Christianity has resources to explain and defend traditional marriage, they have a reason to reconsider their dismissal of Christianity. It's a kind of a, a cultural uh, apologetic. More generally, as the actual fallout of post-Christian thinking becomes increasingly obvious, many are looking for a stronger foundation for their beliefs, and this sh should renew their interest in the Christian faith. It's, it's very interesting there's an explosion of interest in um, parochial and classical Lutheran education, even among the unchurch, and it's because they are afraid of what their sons and daughters are receiving in the public schools. So it's a great opportunity to develop the Christian faith as a response to problems that they themselves have begun to recognize. It's not only Christians, but many secularists who think there's something absurd about self-defined genders. Surely we do not become a different kind of being simply by thinking of ourselves as that kind of being. A pauper does not become a king by thinking he's a king, and a dog lover does not become a dog by thinking he is a dog. So if we face the reality that we have a given nature, that may lead us to realize that we are creatures, not self-creators, and that may prompt us to ask who our creator is. Education. Luther's plan for educational reform falls out of his two kingdoms theology. From the right-hand kingdom, since God wants all people to be saved, everyone should be educated so they can have access to the scriptures. But in order to do that, they must learn how to read, and they must master relevant languages, and have good literary judgment, and develop their analytical and logical abilities, so that they can discern the doctrines that flow from scripture and their implications for their lives, and also to, so they can discern false doctrine. From the left-hand kingdom, it's vital that young people learn respect for authority and are able to carry out their vocations as parents, citizens, and office holders so that they serve as effective means of God's providence for humanity's temporal needs. An understanding of clear communication, how to make a reasoned case, and of the purpose and function of civil institutions, government, and law once called civics, are essential. So is inculcation and training in virtue to promote civil righteousness. For Luther, education is fundamentally about preservation. <clears throat> preservation of the gospel and preservation of civil society. He especially emphasized that gospel cannot be maintained without due study of the languages in which its good news is found. We will not long preserve the gospel without the languages. The languages are the sheath in which the sword of the spirit is contained. They are the casket in which the jewel is enshrined. They are the vessel in which the wine is held. They are the larder in which this food is stored. <clears throat> Likewise, in the temporal sphere, he argued that treasure, walls, buildings, and arms are not enough to maintain a civilized society whose, quote, best and greatest welfare, safety, and strength consist rather in its having many able, learned, wise, honorable, and well-educated citizens. From all of this, Luther is able to motivate a broad, rigorous model of Christian liberal arts education, that thing so much under attack right now, that should be made available to all girls as well as boys, the poor as well as the wealthy. Ironically, given our current context, Luther saw this as a call for universal public education that the civil authorities had an obligation to provide. <clears throat> Yet education has also become a place of conflict between God and Satan. In some of our public schools, the basic tools of literacy and critical thinking are neglected, but students are indoctrinated with a variety of troubling ideologies. In the guise of science, they're told that gender is a choice, and some students are encouraged to pursue physically and psychologically damaging hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgery. 
in the guise of educating children about racial problems, not a bad thing to do, but students are told that the abstract property whiteness confers an inevitable responsibility for racism and systemic racism is advanced as the only possible explanation for disparate educational and social outcomes. Lutherans should object to this on two main grounds. First, teachers who engage in this kind of indoctrination are guilty of abdicating their assigned duty to help students develop their own ability to think. Second, they are like some of the princes of Luther's day, making the false claim that they're the lords of the students' consciences. They have neither the right nor the authority to judge a person's conscience by imputing guilt on the grounds of whiteness, and they are wrongly attempt attempting to impose a contested view of the nature of racism on students who have every right to disagree. The claim that it's only by adopting a tendentious ideology about racism that one can avoid being a racist is so obviously fallacious that an appropriate response would be to require such teachers to take a class in logic, perhaps entitled logic sensitivity training. Uh, this is like you have a fence that needs painting and your neighbor says, well, you must use my paint. Yeah, I know I have a problem, but it doesn't mean that your paint is the paint I should use to paint my fence. So just because there's a problem doesn't mean you have to accept one and only one solution to the problem. Uh, reading some of Thomas Sowell's works would also help to disabuse them of the idea that no well-informed person holds a view contrary to one that they're promulgating. When we move to Christian schools and universities, we see that they're not free from the conflict between God and Satan either, accepting federal funds and external accreditation has fueled a large academic bureaucracy, keen to measure and control Christian education according to criteria that sometimes conflict with an institution's state admission purpose. Accrediting bodies themselves adopt positions on such controversial topics as diversity, equity, and inclusion, which ought to be left as subjects of academic debate. Endless demands for data about academic programs disrupt the actual vocations of teachers and professors, teaching, remember that, mentoring, and scholarship, to feed impersonal data systems, thereby justifying the existence of many petty bureaucrats whose activities do not obviously aid anybody's actual education. St. Paul warns us of those who are not busy, that is, engaged in helping a particular neighbor, but are busy bodies. What busy bodies do is undermine genuine vocations while not serving the needs of any particular human being. Notice that this subverts the very idea of Christian management developed by Luther. The holder of a high office has the moral responsibility of supporting and encouraging the vocations of those entrusted to his care. So the principle uh, from he who has much, much is expected, right, applies here that the more authority your office or vocation gives, the more it is a call for you to support the vocations of those entrusted to your care. There is no such thing as a legitimate vocation that exists to undermine other people's vocations which cannot identify particular neighbors that are helped by its work. So Christian administrators in education should take a close look at whether state requirements are getting in the way of their obligation to promote and support the vocations of teachers and students. Government. The Constitution of the United States is supposed to protect freedom of conscience and expression. But these and many other liberties have been severely compromised by government overreach. During the COVID lockdowns, we saw clear discrimination against churches when the capacities for people permitted to attend church services were much lower than those available to uh, secular businesses. Um, so that you could uh, both buy weed and go to the uh, casino, uh, but not uh, go to the church. The conscientious objections of many students, healthcare professionals, and state employees to vaccine mandates were frequently ignored. Either no recourse to file objection was offered or the objections were overruled without serious consideration uh, of their grounds. There are disturbing signs in many countries that we're slouching toward a model of civil society in which dissent from government policies is viewed as a subversive criminal act rather than a constitutionally protected freedom. Uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau's brutal suppression of the truckers' protests in Ottawa is an egregious example. 
And in Holland, although their intent has been disputed, police have on more than one occasion fired live ammunition when farmers protested proposed bans on nitrogen. And in my view, the harsh treatment of some of those associated with the January 6th protests in Washington, D.C. is another example because it involves lengthy pre-trial uh, imprisonment, and that seems to violate the uh, constitutional right to a speedy trial, and even some basic human uh, rights, which uh, cover the, the same uh, area. In all of these cases, by suppressing the expression of dissenting beliefs, the government is claiming a right it does not have to be lord of citizens' conscience. At the same time, just as some teachers seem to be remarkably uninterested in education, we have seen a proliferation of mayors that do not embrace the demands of their office to serve and protect people. A refusal to enforce laws against violent crimes has made many inner cities unsafe and has prompted businesses to leave to the detriment of many poor and minority individuals who live there. Loyalty to an abstract ideology about racial justice has been placed ahead of caring for the actual citizens, including minorities entrusted to an official's care. In this context, Christian politicians have a special responsibility to model a different way of relating to citizens. They should listen to and care about the welfare and concerns of citizens, even if they personally disagree with them. When they do, they may discover, for example, that many minority families want school choice and are increasingly in favor of parochial and classical alternatives to public education. They may find that the economic hardship imposed by rising energy prices and resultant inflation is a serious problem for many working families. Likewise, Lutheran Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin has listened to those with conscientious objections to COVID vaccine mandates and given a voice to those suffering vaccine-related injuries. A Christian leader should never silence or delegitimize pain because it ought not to exist according to some preconceived narrative. In other words, it shouldn't matter what one thinks uh, about these vaccines. If there are people who are hurting, then you have an obligation to hear their concerns. The church, the scriptures are clear that there is only one gospel, and this gospel consists of the acts of God in the saving work of the person, Jesus Christ. As completely extra nos, it is not up for debate and cannot be redefined or tailored to suit our preferred worldviews or lifestyles. We have the Great Commission and Christ's institution of the sacraments as the means of grace. We must guard the good deposit entrusted to us and serve as ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Now, while we should study our audience and understand its worldview, that's very important to being a good missionary or a good apologist, we have no call to modify the gospel or to exchange it for some other agenda. Sadly, Satan is just as busy battling God in the church as he is outside it. What we see in some mainline churches is the rise of an eclectic, self-centered theology that offers up what suits the passions of worldly itching ears. A popular approach is for the pastor to engage in autobiographical musings that encourage a similar inward-looking focus in the congregation and distract us from what God has done to save us. At one uh, ELCA church I attended, um, because of pulpit exchange, an Assemblies of God pastor gave a sermon about his recent mission trip to build houses for the poor. He confessed that he discovered on that trip that construction was not his gift. I waited expectantly, expectantly for him to say something about how our vocational failures drive us to see our need for Christ, for the one who perfectly followed his vocations of keeping the law and atoning for our sins, his active and passive righteousness. But this connection to the gospel never happened. All I learned was that this man, like me, is not very handy about the house. So by CFW Walther's standards, this message was not a sermon because it didn't preach the gospel. More troubling is a tendency of some clergy to think that they can redesign the gospel. Uh, for example, a few years ago, the Reverend Ann Holmes Redding, an Episcopal priestess in Seattle, declared, I am both Muslim and Christian, just as I am both an American of African descent and a woman. I'm 100% both. She admitted that this was not about the intellect, 
but that she simply resonated with aspects of both religions. Yet the contents of Islam and Christianity cannot be reconciled. Christianity affirms the Trinity, the Incarnation, and the Resurrection, but Islam explicitly denies all three doctrines. Islam views Jesus, or Isa, uh, as a great human prophet, but denies that he is the Son of God, and denies that we need a mediator to be saved. You know, simply, uh, your good deeds need to outweigh your evil deals, deeds on a scale. Now, doubtless, Reverend Redding could say that she came to her opinions honestly, but this does not change the fact that they're not Christian opinions. As C.S. Lewis said about drifting Anglican clergy, quote, we never doubted that the unorthodox opinions were honestly held. What we complain of is your continuing your ministry after you've come to hold them. <laughs> the problem is that the office of a Christian minister does not authorize clergy to act as representatives of other religions. More generally, there's a tendency in Western churches to turn second things into first things. That's that great little essay by C.S. Lewis on first and second things. Uh, that is, something downstream of the gospel is made more important than the gospel. We see this in both politically left-leaning and politically right-leaning churches. On the political left of the church, there is a tendency to make the main focus of preaching social justice issues. Well, the Bible does promote social justice, but ex excessive or exclusive focus on this topic risks obscuring the fact that Jesus did not come into this world to save cultures or societies or countries for that matter, but to save people. The danger is that the social gospel of reforming a world that's passing away supplants the true gospel of eternal salvation from sin. On the political right of the church, there's a tendency to adopt secular business models of marketing and customer service in the hopes that we can grow the church by making a broader appeal. Yet, if what we're marketing is not the gospel, but something we judge to be more attractive to the world's itching ears, this is not faithful to Christ's command. And we may also fall into the false belief that some human technique has the power to save. Although we are called to plant and water the seed of the gospel, it is only God who gives the growth or grants the increase. What then should pastors be doing, as if I, a mere colloquized non-pastor, may be so bold? They should, of course, preach the gospel that we first received, rightly administer the sacraments, and they should teach everything that Christ commanded. That teaching should include thorough grounding in God's word, a strong emphasis on lifelong catechesis, and guidance in how to respond to the world's many challenges. Clear articulation of the faith and its implications combined with effective Christian apologetics are also essential. We should always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us. The goal of apologetics is not to save, since this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Rather, apologetics serves as pre-evangelism, preparatio evangelica, and post-evangelism. As pre-evangelism, apologetics removes obstacles and destroys strongholds of resistance to God and the arguments and opinions raised against the knowledge of God doing the work of the law to prepare the soil for the planting of the gospel. As post-evangelism, apologetics supports greater understanding of our faith, fides quaerens intellectum. Good pastors see their goal as one of developing effective ambassadors of Christ that take the gospel into every walk of life. There, in their many vocations, Christians serve as preserving salt that upholds civilized society, and as beacons of light sharing God's saving message. So, in conclusion, if we see God's two kingdoms as two modes of his providence and love, we're drawn back to his intentions for human beings in both the temporal world and eternity. In both spheres, the calling of Christians is to be faithful to the orders and offices that God has instituted, working to preserve order in the civil realm and to share the one gospel entrusted to us. But in, these life, in this life, 
These orders and offices are the sites of constant battle between God and Satan. Everywhere, inside and outside the church, there are temptations to abdicate, subvert, or usurp offices. We must constantly examine whether office holders are walking away from assigned duties, using their office as a pretext to pursue private interests, or attempting to take a position uh, that God has reserved for himself. While we must respect authority and all the offices God has instituted, we should hold office holders accountable for their use of office. No human beings, inside or outside the church, are authorized to tyrannize those under their care, not to lord it over them, or to claim ultimate lordship of their conscience. An important task of Lutheran social ethics, therefore, is the clear delineation of vocational boundaries so that office holders clearly understand what they are and are not authorized to do. Of course, we know that on account of sin, vocational failure is inevitable. Therefore, we must return in faith to the God who can work all things to good, even through our sinful actions. God is at work in us, in all of our vocations, serving, caring, and providing for both our temporal and eternal needs. A realistic Lutheran social ethic recognizes that our call is simply to do the best we can where God has placed us with the gifts God has given us for the neighbors God has entrusted into our care. We serve God by our faith and our neighbor through those acts of love that he works through us despite our sinful resistance. <clears throat> Ultimately, it's comforting that God's will is not thwarted by our weakness and defection, and our meager efforts, though they do not save, can be used by God to accomplish his good purposes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manoj, uh, for that exposition that connected uh, social ethics with the uh, three estates. I hope to, uh, that this will generate some fruitful discussion. Maybe some of my apologetic students have, have some questions to add. So the mic is at the back of the center aisle. Uh, please identify yourself and where you're from. Uh, Pastor Jean Palm from uh, Trinity Lutheran Church and School, North Morristown, the Missouri Synod Congregation. Um, Dr. Manouche, um, yes. Luther speaks of uh, the three estates. Yes. Uh, so uh, the state, the church, and the home, however you want to com oh. count, economia. Um, you put education in its own category. And it seems to touch all of those. Luther wanted state funding of it. It seems to be a part of the oh, economia, okay. like vocational education and the responsibility of parents. And yet I have a church school, and the church has been intimately yeah. involved in education. Yes. Um, what do we do with this neither fish nor fowl thing? <laughs> Is there a way that we should be thinking about it? what would be helpful for us in clarifying it, especially given you know, our context of massive government spending on schools and assumption that the government is doing it all, um, exclusion of religious freedom in schools, um, failure of vocational education. Your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. That is an excellent question. Um, I see education exactly as you say. It's a point of overlap between the two kingdoms, and it is involved in all three economies. Families should not abdicate their responsibility to see that their children are well-educated to uh, anyone, right? They have to make a determination for what counts as a good education, yet at the same time, what is a good education must support what's good for both the civil order and for the church. 
So I, I think to, to back to those who are concerned about uh, parochial education, or they may have, as we did, have done classical homeschooling. They are, they are concerned that the parents know what students are being taught. It's, it's a family responsibility, but they are also concerned that these will be good church members and people who are effective as citizens uh, in, the, in the society. So it is, as you suggest, I think that's right on. It's, it's a very holistic uh, matter and I find it disturbing that sometimes even Christians are tempted to think that, well, they can kind of outsource this. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Um, first of all, there's a primary responsibility to the family. Secondly, you cannot be indifferent to the implications of the education of your children for whether they will be good members of the church and society, right? That all of those things have to be considered at once, it seems to me, to get a, uh, a good result. And when you see um, things going on in the public uh, schools, we, uh, at the, the, the church school at my church, Trinity in Sheboygan, can no longer even take the early grade children to the public library across the street because of the appalling um, propaganda that has been put there in the children's uh, sections. Some of it is outright pornographic and other things that are there are clearly promoting anti-biblical uh, uh, views. Um, so that, that's the kind of level of responsibility people really need to wake up to, to having. But that's an excellent question. And how much of the state could we carve out of education before we would do damage uh, yeah. to its place with education? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what I think. I'm totally in favor um, of getting rid of the uh, Department of Education altogether. I, I think that it, it's gotten to the point where it has way too much power to uh, require schools to do things that go directly contra contrary to the interests of the family and are actually both detri the detrimental to both the society and to the uh, church. So I think that a kind of devolution that would take back the, the control into the hands of, uh, of families and associations of families would be a, a far preferable situation. Isn't it ironic, as I mentioned, that Luther thought that public education was the solution in his time, right? And now we're, I think we're at a very different cultural moment right now than, than he was. Any others? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Um, first of all, a friend of mine, Kevin Belter, an old student of yours, asked me to greet you. Oh. And he also said, don't make it weird. <laughs> so, I don't know if I did what he said. Um, what you wrote about how the civil authorities don't have a clay on people's conscience um, it seems it, it addresses like a disconnect that we can have sometimes because in Ephesians we're told that we should serve the authorities not, not because they are God but as if they were the Lord to have a good conscience mm -hmm. and it seems like that can just be a very difficult thing at times especially if we I mean it's even hard to know how to teach it like I think I taught in maybe a, an overly broad, clumsy way in confirmation class a couple weeks ago that we should pay our taxes with a smile on our face. Yeah. But I'm not necessarily sure that I taught that right. So maybe you could speak to this difficulty of how the, the, the civil authorities don't have a claim on our conscience, but our conscience does have to do with how we serve them. Yeah, that is a really good uh, question as well. And um, I, I think that in this sense, our conscience does call us to respect the offices that have been instituted by God, right? But when Luther is speaking over the issue of a claim on the conscience, he is saying that no, where the government now enters a sphere that God has reserved for himself. In other words, where they require you to espouse a teaching which is directly contrary to God's teaching. And so it's like in the Lutheran Confessions, Romans 13 is always balanced with Acts 5.29, that we shall obey God rather than men. It's at the point, 
so that their, their office in and of itself is God-ordained and must be respected. But at the point that they misuse their office to require us to um, basically defile our faith, right, and say something which is contrary to what we in good conscience believe as Christians, that, I think, is where the overreach uh, occurs. All right, like, like what's going on that was mentioned uh, by uh, Dr. Stigmar this, this morning in, in, in Sudan, right, requiring um, people to um, desecrate crucifixes. That's clearly trying to be a lord over somebody's conscience. I'm Jeffrey Kenning, a pastor in uh, Zion Lutheran at Dexter, Iowa, and St. John's Lutheran at Casey, Iowa. On page four, you speak about how Christians and non-Christians uh, occupy offices or stations, Stunden. Uh, just curious, Luther elsewhere uh, uses the terms Beruf and Amt, yeah. and I wonder, in your reading of him, do you see, uh, does he distinguish those three, three uh, words, or are they essentially synonymous, or do they apply to different spheres? Uh, how, how, does he, how does he use those words? Yeah, so the Baruf, I mean, that literally means calling, and most of the time when Luther's speaking about calling, he clearly means Christian calling, and that's why in the, uh, on, on, on temporal authority, he says, don't think that because you're a prince, this, this lets you out of your primary calling as a Christian, I think that the idea of a stand is more general because God stations every, everyone in this world, even the unbeliever. And you think, of, for example, in the Old Testament, Cyrus, in that sense, was called. Now, he wasn't called as a Christian because he wasn't a Christian, right? But yet he was still used by God to accomplish his good purposes. Um, You'd need a better scholar in the languages than I am to uh, give you a better answer to your question, but that's my, that's my basic sense of the, of, of the matter, that there's a difference between being called as a Christian and being stationed in this world. I, I think that even unbelievers are stationed in this world because they're, they're put there so that God's will is done through them, um, even against their own uh, will. Thanks. Maybe... Oh yeah, I, I didn't deal with that. I don't, I don't know how to address that, that other uh, query you had about that word, I'm sorry. Hello, I'm Josiah Hoppe and I'm a student here. On page nine you talked about how, uh, about teachers who engage in this kind of indoctrination are guilty of abdic abdicating their assigned duty to help students de develop their own, own ability to think and make the false claim that they are lords of the students' consciences. How do you respond to people who might use these same points to argue against parochial schools and Christian education? Oh, yeah, that's a really uh, good question. Well, but our, our goal, though, is to set people free. And I think that, right, go back to what Jesus says, the truth will set you free. And what we can point to is the fact that the results of the uh, gospel are that people freely serve others in constructive ways. Think about, for example, how the Romans became impressed after um, centuries of persecution with the fact that Christians simply were good citizens and that this was really rather a pointless um, exercise. So I think that against that kind of uh, reply, we could say, by their fruits ye shall know them. If you want to think that our, what we're doing is indoctrination of the same kind, well, let's consider which of the two um, reaps fruits that are harmful and which are beneficial, and that would be, I think, a fair um, re response, because certainly the, the, um, the, the fruits of the um, trans ideology right now are clearly harmful if we look them square in the, in the face, but we can provide lots of reasons to think that um, the inculcation of uh, Christian values has been, has been beneficial. And we can do that throughout all history, right? For example, uh, Alvin Schmidt's great book, How Christianity Changed the, the World, um, provides lots of evidence to uh, back that up. But that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello there, Timothy Schmeling from Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary. Thank you for your paper, Dr. Manoj. We really appreciate it. Um, Lutherans often talk about how God works through law and gospel, and yet there also is this providence thing, and you talk how God works in both kingdoms. He has providence as well. How do we as Lutherans map providence and relate it to law and gospel, and how do we distinguish it from the way that you know, Reformed theology and Roman Catholics think about providence? Oh, well, um, I certainly think that both are a kind of providence. It's, it's like when you think, for example, of the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it both convicts the world of sin, so then it's doing the, the work of the law, and yet it also um, creates faith. So it's doing both of those. I think those are both modes of providence in the most general sense, that, that providence is the way that God bestows goods on, on his uh, creation, but I don't think it would fall, for example, into the, any kind of reformed sense that um, that means that some people are predestined to, desti- uh, to a damnation, for example. Um, those gifts, as I tried to emphasize, they're for everyone, and just as the same rain falls on the, uh, you know, the righteous and the unrighteous, that, that God's offer in Christ is made available to all people. Um, and so uh, then if those gifts are rejected in either kingdom, the responsibility for that will lie with uh, hum- human beings. Um, so I think there's still a, a way that we can carve out a, a difference between a, a Lutheran understanding of that and a, a Reformed uh, one. Yeah, did our other speakers have questions that they would like to direct to Dr. Manoj at this time? There's a mic there. Yes. Uh, oh, here. Hi, uh, oh, sorry. My name is Gabriel, I'm a student here. Yeah. So I had a question uh, regarding page 10, it deals with uh, government. Yeah. So as the uh, government becomes increasingly uh, oppressive in its views towards religious institutions, how do we as Christians peacefully resist without, um, while serving the state and Christ as illustrated in New Testament? Yeah, I think it's going to take the, the wisdom of uh, serpents. So there are a couple of things that, that, that one could do. The, the um, ex- extreme option, which more and more schools are considering, is getting out from under federal funding altogether, right? That's the Luther Classical College and the Hillsdale College kind of a- approach because then you can more easily be more faithful to your mission. But the other thing, if that's not a realistic option, is we need to do much more work in finding out what the constitutional rights really are. It seems to me that a lot of Christian institutions are uh, too easily say, well, accreditation requires us to do this, where in fact it would be possible to negotiate a better outcome. I don't think that we've been strong enough in standing up for our rights, just as we saw during the the lockdowns that many uh, churches, um, frankly, folded rather too quickly when they had a serious constitutional challenge that was then, you know, uh, recorded with, with, uh, for example, uh, Gorsuch's, uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch's uh, decisions um, uh, in in both uh, the East and West West Coast. So I'm afraid that the issue is going to have to come down to Christian organizations are going to have to get a lot more savvy about what their legal constitutional rights are, and they're going to need to start uh, asserting uh, those. That's why I've gotten more and more interested in these kind of legal issues uh, at this point in my career. I wouldn't have really didn't want to go into them particularly, but I'm afraid it's become necessary, right? So free passage of the gospel can only happen if you have a, a legal situation which will make it something other than a criminal offense to spread the gospel. And likewise, Christian institutions of learning are, are need to have a much stronger understanding of the, the legal position to uh, maintain their rights.
Hello, my name is Jacob Klug, Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. Some of my political beliefs are matters of faith and matters of conscience. Some of them are not, say, my opinion on a value-added tax. So if that is true, is the oppression, uh, or the, not the oppression, the suppression of a belief or a political opinion by the government always a matter of the government lording over my conscience? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. Is it always a matter of lording over the conscience is, is really the, the heart of the question? Yeah, so the answer is um, no. There are a couple of uh, issues. So one is someone might uh, conscientiously believe something which is clearly harmful. So they're a faithful follower of the Aztec religion and they think that therefore they should be able to rip the living heart out of another human being. Well, of course, that's not going to be uh, allowed. And likewise, in emergency situations, in fact, I have a paper with a Canadian judge on this very topic, is when is there a compelling interest that the government has in maintaining safety such that they can override even conscientious objections? So it's not, certainly is not always the case that the conscience wins. After all, believe it or not, the governing authorities have conscience too, right? And it would, it would harm their conscience if a policy led to the avoidable death of many people. Let's suppose there was an Ebola outbreak uh, in the United States. Well, then the stakes are so high that the government would be justified even in overriding uh, conscientious objections to certain measures. So those are actually, in practice, very difficult matters. But what has disturbed me in recent years is that um, in cases where a conscience claim has frequently been recognized in the past, they were simply swept under the rug without serious consideration. So the wrong that was done there was not that everybody's conscience was uh, recognized. That, that is always going to be the case, I would expect. But the dismissive attitude to the conscience as if it wasn't something that really needed to be taken into serious consideration. Uh, because think how bad that, that could be if your em employer uh, requires you to do something directly contrary to your deepest uh, conviction, all right? So I want you to, um, uh, like Mark Studdock in That Hideous Strength, I want you to go in this room and I want you to desecrate this crucifix as a condition of your employment here. That's the point at which there is, is clear overreach. But in general, no, um, it's not the case that they can never override conscience. That's, that's, you're, you're right on about that. Thank you. Now, were there any other questions from the audience at this time? How about uh, the other speakers? Okay. Yep. Uh, there will be uh, at Bethany Lutheran College Trinity Chapel a uh, Reformation Choral Vespers held at 4.30. Uh, could we again have a round of applause uh, for our presenters today? <laughs>